I would like to uh, invite our first speaker uh, on the stage. Uh, she is uh, Daria Taskina. Uh, she is a second year master student at the York uh, University in Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, she has worked with um, her supervisor, uh, uh, Georg Zoyd, for a third year now, and uh, she uh, and they are investigating uh, seizure, seizures in uh, zebrafish. So uh, I am I'm glad to, to, to hear her talk uh, about uh, panexin knockout zebrafish and seizures in zebrafish. Okay, perfect, thank you. I'll uh, share my screen. Okay, all good? Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for tuning in to my talk. My name is Daria, and I'll be talking about a protein called Panexin-1 and how we've generated uh, a Naka zebrafish model to investigate seizures. So I'll dive right into Panexin-1. Uh, this is an integral membrane channel that is mostly known for releasing ATP into the extracellular space. Uh, they're located on astroglia and neurons, uh, highly expressed in cortical and hippocampal neurons, and are localized in the lateral postsynaptic density. So the reason as to why Panexin-1 has been a research of interest in terms of epilepsy is due to the fact that it has been shown to be highly expressed um, mRNA and protein in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, and it's been correlated to a recurrent seizures, uh, high recurrent occurrences of seizures. And so with that fact, along with the fact that it releases ATP, there's a hypothesis that Panexin-1 contributes to seizure propagation. So I'll go over uh, two main models as how to Panexin-1 could be involved. Uh, I won't go into the diagram too in detail, but essentially on the left here in the green, this is a model for when Panexin-1 is um, helping to propagate seizures. So it has to do with a heightened concentration of glutamate and it creates a hyperactive excitatory loop. And on the right here on, in pink, this is a model for how Panexin-1 could be uh, inhibiting terminating seizures instead. And this has to do with uh, its interactions P2Y, inhibiting glutamate release and um, and basically creating a hypopolarization in the postsynaptic neuron. So there's two um, main models that are being um, looked at, and we're trying to find out which uh, model is more, um, which model Panexin-1 resembles more. So we've done that in zebrafish. Uh, and to some of you may come to a surprise, but actually zebrafish have been a very well-established animal model uh, in terms of seizure investigations, and it is done by chemically inducing seizures in them. And so they show uh, behavior that is tonic and clonic-like locomotion. So I hope you can see the video on the right here. This is sort of this involuntary um, jerking movement that they do, and then followed by a loss of balance. Uh, so it's quite um, a widespread phenomenon that we see in um, larvae and adult zebrafish as well when you induce seizures in them. As well as electrophysiology, there's evidence of ictal-like events in their brain when you induce, uh, chemically induce. Uh, to, so to summarize, we want to see how Panexin-1 contributes to seizure propagation, and we've done that in our zebrafish larvae. So we've created three models. Uh, we have our wild type, so that's our normal zebrafish, and we've induced them with a convulsant called PDZ. Uh, we also have a second model, which is a Panexin-1 knockout. So here we genetically modified the fish to lack Panexin-1, and we want to see how they would have their seizures instead. And finally, we have a third model, which is our wild type treated probenecid. Uh, probenecid is a panexin-1 blocker. So here we're looking at phar pharmacologically targeting uh, panexin-1 and seeing how that might change things for them. Uh, we looked into it in three different ways. So we looked at behavior, uh, kind of like the video that I showed you, we're looking at uh, convulsive activity that they might exhibit. We're looking at descriptional data. So here we looked at immediate early genes that have been associated with either epilepsy or stress response. So seeing how that might differ between our models. And finally, we looked into electrophysiology and we looked into local field recordings in their brain to see uh, in vivo. So this is actually a new model for Panexin-1 in zebrafish uh, in vivo models. We we're excited to see our results. And I'll showcase some of them here today. Uh, so for the behavior here on the graph, uh, the y-axis is their locomotion. Uh, 
and the x-axis axis is the time. So at the top, this is the Panexin 1 deletion model. So we're looking at the blue line, which is our wild type being induced with PDZ. And the orange line is the Panexin 1 knockout. So their base activity, which is the top left, uh, is pretty indistinguishable. On the baseline, they don't really differ much in activity. But when it comes to when you treat with them with PDZ, which is on the top right, you can see a spike in hyperactivity that lasts about an hour and then subsidizes. And you can see how the Panexin 1 model is uh, that hyperactivity is reduced. This hyperactivity is indicative of those seizure-like events that we saw in the video. And at the bottom here, here we have a model for Panexin 1 block. So what if we pharmacologically blocked it? And that's depicted in the dark blue line. So again, the baseline, obviously they're both wild type are indistinguishable. When you pre-incubate with probenesid, you can see a spike in activity. So they do react to the drug, but then that activity goes down to baseline. And once you add PDZ, you can see that the ones that have been pre-incubated with probenesid don't show the same type of spike in activity. Their activity goes down uh, quite immediately. Uh, we also looked at the immediate early genes using the real-time PCR. And uh, just to uh, reiterate, these genes are associated with either um, heightened their upregulation happens during either epilepsy or stress response. And we've seen that in terms of uh, deletion or blocking probenesid, these upregulations are reduced. And this is a logarithmic scale. So let's say 100-fold upregulation have been reduced to 50 or 30 in some of the genes. And for survival, we've seen that in the first 10-hour trajectory, the wild type and the Panexin 1 knockout is fairly similar. And we can see the probenesid pre-incubated wild types are actually doing quite kind of bad in the first 10 hours. And we think that has to do uh, with probenesid potentially interacting with their metabolism and also the fact of adding two drugs might be uh, creating toxicity effect for them as well. But it's interesting that after 24 hours, we've seen that pre-incubated with probenesid, they're actually doing the best and followed by Panexin 1 knockout and then uh, wild type. Uh, and our, for our last results I want to show you today, uh, this was done by our, our very talented PhD student Paige. So she has done in vivo um, local field potential recordings in the brain's optic tectum of the zebrafish. So on the left, this is a trace of the wild type. Um, and in the red, this is their seizure, typical seizure activity. And then we have on the right, which is the Panexin 1 knockout and their uh, typical LFP trace. And here we've seen that these type of seizure events, uh, ictal events, are reduced for the Panexin 1 knockout, as well as their duration is reduced as well. So overall, uh, what we have done is we've established a Panexin 1 knockout in vivo model for a seizure investigation. And when we've done that, we've seen that the deletion or block of Panexin 1 reduced seizures in terms of behavior, molecular stress response, and uh, associated hyperactivity in the brain. So we conclude that Panexin 1 channels most likely contribute to propagating seizures in terms of that ex uh, excitatory loop creating uh, hyperactivity in the brain. And lastly, I'd like to make some acknowledgement, acknowledgements to our lab, our uh, Dr. George Zoidel's lab, and the Vivarium staff as well to help and support us uh, throughout these times. I'd like to make a special shout out to Paige, who I've been working with closely on this project, and our supervisor as well. Uh, and thank you. That's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria, for, uh, for the great talk and uh, the insights that, that you gave us. So uh, if, the, if we have questions from uh, our attendees or also from uh, our speakers, other speakers, they are also welcome to, to ask um, to ask questions. Just use the, uh, the Q&A uh, Q box. Um, otherwise, I have, uh, in the meantime, I have a um, kind of uh, curiosity about uh, um, how you how you measure the um, LFP uh, in uh, in zebrafish? So mm -hmm. uh, if it's a kind of invasive or uh, if you just measure the, the in the water? 
Uh, so actually you put them because they can't be really moving while you're recording. Otherwise you'd have a lot of uh, movement artifacts. You'd put them in agar and then you put water on top. So they, uh, they're not really, they can survive for hours in that type of medium. And then you uh, put the electrode in and it's quite, it looks thick, but it's actually very, very thin. So it's not, even if you pull out the fishes, uh, circulation is fine and it's not really going to affect the fish as much. Um, and we're recording the extracellular from the extracellular space. So it's a pool of um, activity that we're looking at. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. And um, let's see if we have, uh, okay. Uh, I, we, we have a question from Celia. Uh, yeah, the, the, the speakers cannot uh, ask questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, Silva is asking um, how old were the zebrafish larvae? Oh, sorry, how old they are? Uh, the zebrafish uh, larvae. Oh yeah, so they're seven days old at this point. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you again, Daria, for uh, for your talk and yeah. for answering our our questions. I think we can uh, uh, we can proceed and we.